Thank you all for coming back from lunch. We will continue our proceedings some uh, for this afternoon. Uh, uh, Council, are you ready? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, we are ready to proceed with our next witness. Thank you very much. If you can, please. <laughs> I Babakar Sanya. I Babakar Sanya. Do swear that. Do swear that. I'll speak the truth. I'll speak the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. So help me God. So help me God. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Witness. Are you comfortable? Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Just some few housekeeping rules before we begin. Um, can you speak clearly into the mic? Speak loudly as well and slowly so that everybody can hear you and we can actually follow your testimony. Um, also, just so that you know what you're going to expect today, we'll be going through your testimony and I'll be covering certain topics. Um, the first topic that we will cover would be your personal information, your educational background, your professional experience, and then we will then move on to your experience of the 1994 coup d'etat. Um, later on, we will go through the events of the um, of November 11th, 1994, and finally we will stop at your own victimization um, and personal torture. But however, for, for today, um, we will see how far we're going to get because we might not be able to finish the testimony. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Can you tell the commissioners what your full names are? Thank you, Ma. Um, good afternoon, um, Chairman of the Commission and the Commissioners here present, councils, and the general public. I am Lieutenant Colonel Babukar Sanya. Where do you live? Presently, I live in Lamen. Um, can you tell us what your present position and rank is? My rank is um, Lieutenant Colonel and appointed as the, the Commander Training Tax Force at the Gambia Armed Forces Headquarters. Can you tell us when and where you were born and where you grew up? 
I was born in Busra uh, village, Combo Central, Western Region, on the 6th of March, 1966. And then I was brought up in that same village. Busra village um, actually found in the Gambia? Busra village is almost um, 15 kilometers south of Brikama towards Dimbaya, the border. Where did you attend? Um, I believe I already asked you where you attended secondary school. Actually, before the secondary school, I attended primary school in Busra. Then when I completed um, my primary education in 1980, I proceeded to become a secondary school and then completed in 1984. Can you tell us what you did when you completed your secondary education in 1984? Good. Um, after completing the secondary education in 1984, um, I actually I worked at the military agricultural department for some couple of months, then got selected into the army on the 11th of August 1984. And I started my training on the 2nd of January 1985. So you enlisted into the army um, in 1984? Yes, on the 11th of August 1984. But the training started on the 2nd of um, January 1985. How long did the training last? It lasted for four months. And where was it conducted? In Yundum Barracks. Um, can you tell us who was the commander at the training school then? Good. Um, the training school then, it was under the supervision of the BAT, that is the British Army Training Team headed by Major Wright, and the Army Commander then was um, Colonel Downjai. Were you deployed anywhere after you finished your recruitment training? Actually, when I finished my training um, in May 16th was the day that I passed out. When I finished 1985. Basically, during the recruit training, it happens that um, I was spotted by the British, especially Sergeant Major Allen, who spotted me, and then it's like I can be a good um, instructor. Then, not surprisingly, um, in 1987, 86, 87, precisely. I was attached to Sergeant Major Allen as um, a drill movement demonstrator. Um, at this point, um, Lieutenant, what was your rank? All right. Um, I was a lance corporal. But actually, before attaining the Lance Corporal rank, I was, you know, nominated to do a junior in Jokada course that I did. Then thereafter, based on my performance, I successfully, you know, completed the course and then ended up promoted to a first class. Right. Um, initially, when you were recruited, you were a private, is that correct? I was a private soldier. In fact, I was a recruit, then become a private soldier immediately after the passing out. Um, Lieutenant, um, you are very accomplished um, as, um, you know, your position actually, you know, um, states. As a Lieutenant Colonel in the Army, you're a very accomplished person. Um, you have shared your CV with the commission, yes. and um, we will not really have time to go into all of your um, accolades and awards and different credentials. Can you just state um, from 
um, recruitment up to 1994, you know, your different ranks and positions in the Army. Just in summary, no need to go into much detail. Thank you. Like I said, after my passing out, first I did a course that is um, Junior Initial Kada course. Then I got promoted to Lance Corporal. Thereafter, I did the Section Commander's course, promoted to a, a corporal. Thereafter, I did the Platoon Sergeant course and got promoted to a sergeant. Then within the sergeant, I did another course called can you, can you just, sorry to interrupt you, can you just help us with the dates as you go along? Thank you. If you can remember. Well, okay. Um, actually, 1996 was when I was promoted to a Lance Corporal. Then, um, that was, I think, uh, around June or so. Then, 1997, I was promoted to a Corporal. Um, 98, to a Sergeant. Then, but it goes along with um, courses because um, during those days, in the British, when the British were in charge of the training school, you cannot be promoted without um, doing a particular course to handle that rank. All right. So um, when I was promoted to a sergeant, I I did um, another course that is called a tactical cadre course. Tactical cadre course, which I did, and then got promoted to a staff sergeant. Um, that was in 1988, getting to 1989. Then from there, I did my um, drill and duties course. Um, um, then from the drill and duties course, I got promoted. Uh, when I was promoted to a staff sergeant, I did all these courses. That is the drill and duties and then the warrant officers course. Then, from 1998, I was a staff sergeant. But along the line also, I was deployed to various um, units within the Gambia uh, National Army then. That is, within the, the companies, Alpha, between Alpha Company and Bravo Company. Alpha Company in those days was the company responsible for the security, and then Bravo Company was the company responsible for ceremonial duties and okay. then yeah if i may just um come in there you left the training school um as as um a drills movement instructor and from there where did you move to well i i i, I moved from being attached to sergeant major allen as a drill movement um, demonstrator not instructor um, I was um, deployed to Bravo Company. Then um, was Bravo, Bravo Company within um, the Yundum Barracks? Of course, yes, ma'am. Bravo Company was within um, Yundum Barracks, responsible for ceremonial duties. Yeah. From there, where did you move to? Um, from the company, um, obviously, it goes down to... Did you go to Farafanya? Yes, I was one time deployed to Farafanya. That was 1986-87, um, um, precisely. Um, my deployment to Farafanya was um, just a transition. We were post, I mean, deployed there to um, carry out um, a rehearsal for the possible redeployment to the Confederal Battalion. So the rehearsal for that parade was done in Farafeje. Well, I think uh, we spent in Farafeje about um, either one month or two months sort of. Then we came back here. Then before finally we are deployed to Kudang. How long did you spend in Kudang? Kudang, if I could remember, I spent about seven months in Kudang. Whilst in Kudang, this was around um, 86, 87. Whilst I was in Kudang, that was the time that um, I was returned to come and then do my um, junior intro cadre course. So once, immediately when I finished the 
the, um, the Kada course, went back to Kudang because of the fact that I've passed the course, I was withdrawn from Kudang and attached to the, the training school under Sergeant Major Allen. Can you tell us what happened next? Um, like I said, I, uh, with the chronological order that I've mentioned here earlier on, that goes up to 1990, um, sorry, 1989. Um, then I was a staff sergeant. Um, then 1991, I was supposed to be deployed to ECOMOG. Um, during the first um, contingent, but um, we had another, I had another assignment um, on the ground at the training school. Then finally, I was deployed to ECOMOC in 1991. And how long did that mission last? In Liberia, I was there for almost seven or eight months. Although we were supposed to come back at the end of the six months, because the tour of duty then, it was um, six months. But uh, due to the fact that we, we had some logistics problems, the command, there was no flight, so we had to extend our stay there up to seven months or eight months. Sort of. Who was the commander of your group to Echo Mog? Um, my company was led by um, uh, Major Bob Karijata. Yes. And um, what was this group made up of? How many soldiers actually went on the mission? We went uh, with a number of um, 150 personnel. When you finished your mission and you returned back to the Gambia, what did you do? Well, when I returned back from, um, from Liberia, um, I was attached to the, uh, at the RSM as a drill sergeant the drill sergeant at um, Yudum Barracks. Okay. When you um, returned back from ECOMOG, were you actually aware of any demonstrations that occurred um, within the soldiers at the time? Yes. Um, I was, in fact, um, aware of that um, demonstration that was um, done. And then some soldiers were um, arrested and then um, um, taken to court. Can you tell us um, what the circumstances around those demonstrations were, if you know? Yes, ma. Um, the circumstances surrounding the demonstration was like um, it has to do with um, pay and allowance and then probably with um, welfare. Tell us what the outcome was um, after those demonstrations occurred? Yeah, like I said, um, after when the demonstration was mounted, um, some soldiers were, were, were arrested. And then um, investigations were mounted to look into the circumstances that led to the, to the demonstration. And then obviously, through their findings, they later realized that, okay, well, the soldiers acted based on, you know, probably their allowances and then other, you know, um, logistics issues. And then were arraigned before a court of law and finally some of them got convicted. Do you know if these allowances were later paid to them? Um, I, yes, I think they were later paid. But it, it delayed. So when you came back from ECOMOC, your mission um, with the ECOMOC, where did you go next? Yes. When I came back from ECOMOC, I was in Yendum, like I said, as a, um, a drill sergeant under um, our RSM, that is RSM-5, Ismaila. Then after Ismaila-5, then you have um, rsm Jung. I was um, closely working with them. Did um, RSM Jeng remain at um, Yundum with you? Yes, you know, um, when RSM Fai um, got retired, um, Jeng came in. 
So Yang was with us there in Union Barracks until I think, uh, was it 1992 or three, when he was redeployed to the headquarters. Then RSM is um, Alaji Fai took over from, you know, um, RSM Jeng. So along the line, um, I've been working with them as um, a drill instructor responsible for, you know, ceremonial duties. Um, and as a drill instructor in um, Yundum, can you tell us who you were working with? Right. Um, as a drill instructor and then also a drill sergeant, I was there with um, um, John Gomez, who is now uh, Major Gomez at um, Fajara Barracks, um, Alaji Kanyi. Alaji Kanyi was also a drill sergeant with us. Can you tell us what um, Alaji Kanyi's um, rank was at the time? Yes, Alaji Kanyi was then a corporal. But the mere fact that um, he was made a drill sergeant was um, he was very active when it comes to drill and ceremonies, and then he likes he likes the field. For that one, I can I can attest to it. Uh, but along the line, it's like um, he was understudying us, myself and John, and uh, until such a time that he was promoted to a sergeant. Um. This was during the period of 93, 92, 93, 94. You remained as a drill sergeant at Yundum, working under the different um, RSMs at the time. Can you tell us um, where you were on the day of the 22nd July military takeover? Good. Um, the day of this um, military takeover, that is, is 22nd July 1994, met me in Farafenye. Why I was in Farafenye was based on um, a course, a refresher course that we went to um, carry out in preparation to train one of our intakes, that is Intake 17. Can you tell us, um, did anything happen on that particular day whilst you were doing the training? All right, um, that particular day was the day that we had our teaching practice. Like, um, it's a sort of a test, practical test, to gauge the level of the students on, on, in, the, in the course. So it happens that um, by 8.30, under the supervision of um, Sergeant Major Abaya, a Nigerian, and then Sergeant Victor Ford. Sorry, Ford also was a drill sergeant, so we were four in numbers just to put uh, in Yundum, that just to put um, records right. So um, that actually um, date, we were in the field doing our TP, um, because the program started at 8.30. So almost 30 minutes or thereabout into the, 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 the TP, teaching practice, um, Sergeant Major Abaya was called by Colonel Saliuk. He was the training school commander by then. And then what they discussed there, actually I don't know because we were in the field. So when Sergeant Major Abaya came back, he told Sergeant Ford to suspend the, the program, that um, there is an emergency, that we, 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 we should stand down. All right. Um, at this point, um, you mentioned various um, soldiers, Staff Sergeant Victor Ford, Abaya, WO2 Abaya. What nationality were these soldiers? WO2 Abaya and um, Sergeant um, Victor Ford, they are all Nigerians. Was the commander um, of the army at that point also a Nigerian? Yes, ma'am. That is Colonel Abubakar Dada. Yeah, sorry, General Abubakar Dada, sorry. You mentioned um, at some point during your own training that it was the BAT, the British Army training team, that was actually in, in charge of the training school. Um, and there was a Gambian command, um, commander at the time. Can you tell us when the Nigerians actually um, took over command? 
the Nigerians um, arrived in Nigeria in, in, in 1992. In 1994, during the military takeover, it was the Nigerians who were in command of the of the army. Exactly, ma'am. Can you just tell us um, what happened next after you received this message that there was a problem? Immediately when we received um, that um, information from Sergeant Major Abaya, we were put on standby. But meanwhile, we were asked to go and then draw our rifles and then to be on standby. Can you tell us approximately what time this was during the day? Yes, it was in the afternoon, uh, getting towards um, 10, 11 o'clock, yeah, between that hour. We were asked to be on standby what, for what? Can you explain? Well, based on the, I mean, uh, the information that there is emergency in Banjun, that um, there is something going on in Banjun, that people were, um, the soldier, all the battalions were on standby, so obviously Farafenye also will not be left out. That's why we were put on standby. Did you do anything next? Yes, like I said, we were asked to go and then draw our rifles and then be on standby. Did you go anywhere? Whilst we were uh, in Farafine, sorry, and within the, the guard room end, around um, 12 o'clock we were gathered again and then given the instructions that um, um, there's an instruction that um, the command should deploy troops to Bara from Farafenye. So um, it happens that um, most of us who came from here to Farafenye to I mean, attend that course were a part of you know, the soldiers who were in fact handpicked or like uh, nominated or selected to, 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 to take the North Bank to Bara. Who gave you those instructions? Um, the instructions actually came from um, Lieutenant Jiba, that is Sam Jiba, um, together with Yanku Bature. Yes, but when the information came, when they came and then gave us the instructions that, okay, well, we'll be going to Farafenye, the first thing that became an obstacle was the means of transport. Before we get... Um before we get there, um, Mr. Witness, can you just tell us what the position of um, Jiba and Ture were? They were all um, platoon commanders. They were, leading, they were leading the group? Yes. Immediately when that uh, nomination was made, that this is the group that should take the North Bank coming down to Bara, they were nominated. That is, Sam Jiba being the senior one, seconded by Yanko Ture. For us to come. So how did you get to Barra? Um, like I said, the first obstacle that we encounter was the means of transport. Then there was no transport in Fajal Barak at that particular time. So we were just, you know, standing there, you know, doing nothing. Then all of a sudden, um, the issue of, you know, getting civilian vehicle came in. That was, in fact, I don't, it was initiated by LF Jame within the, the soldiers. But from the officers where that thing, that idea was initiated, I don't know. But it was LF Jame who brought that idea to us. So LF Jame was one of the soldiers in your group? Very well. Can you tell us um, what the size of your group um, was how many soldiers were actually involved in the mission? Actually, it has been taking a very, very long time. I will not be able to ascertain the figure. You also mentioned um, that you took um, weapons from the armory before you left for the mission. Can you tell us what kind of weapons you were armed with? Those were AK-47. AK-47. So you mentioned that you started commandeering civilian vehicles, or you attempted to do so. Can you just tell us um, a little about what you actually did? 
All right. When the information um, reached us that well, um, the situation is like um, we, 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 we don't have any transport, so what we have to result in um, getting civilian trucks, you know. Obviously, yes, we took action by um, commandeering one um, vehicle, one truck, just by the, uh, along the, the highway. If you know Farafenje, just by the highway. So I'm so just stood there and then directed one truck into the barracks. So when the vehicle came, you know, the driver um, was instructed that, well, he's going to take us to, to, to Barra. But actually, definitely, the driver was not that much comfortable. He was telling people that, okay, he's on a mission, that they hired him, but um, like soldiers, you know, once they need your service, it is their service force before your personal service. So this is how it happens. And then when they came, when the vehicle came, we were asked to board. Then we bought the vehicle. Then the, the driver was asked to drive to the petrol station in Farafenye. So when we went to the petrol station, we stopped. And the driver, in fact, as we were going, he was not comfortable. So immediately when we arrived at the petrol station, he just debouched from the, his vehicle and then just walked about some few minutes and squat there. Then some of the soldiers went to talk to the, um, the fuel attendant at the time because the issue was that we were supposed to fuel the vehicle without paying, you know. So when they talked to the guy, I understand the guy told them that, well, he had to consult his boss before he could allow or he could fuel the vehicle. So when the guy went to inform his boss, we are so in a hurry, so the soldiers in fact started pumping. You know, those, those days, even there was no electricity, you can still pump you know, by using, you know, manual means. So instead of pumping gas oil in, they mistakenly pump petrol into the truck. So that resulted, you know, in the vehicle having a breakdown. We could not move. So within that, you know, uh, instant, another truck was commandeered, and then this is how we got the truck to go to Faraf uh, Barra. But that truck, in fact, when the driver came, and then we relayed him, he was informed about the mission, forcing his apprentice, in fact, they abandoned, they abandoned the vehicle. It was only the driver, because he cannot abandon the vehicle. But the apprentice, they left. Can you tell us um, what the size of this vehicle was? No, it was a mini truck. A mini truck, not that much big. These um, gele gele trucks. I'm just trying to establish the size of your group. Um, yeah. Was it up to um, the size of a platoon? No, 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 no. It was so you were less than a platoon? Less than a platoon. But can you just give us an approximate um, number, if you can remember? Uh, probably uh, um, 15, 15 or so. Actually, I cannot remember. It's, it's a long time. When you eventually got the vehicle and the driver to take you to, to Barra. What time are we talking about? What time was that? It was in the afternoon, after 12. There about, getting to one, one or two, so. So you started your journey. Can you tell us what happened along the yes. way? Yes, yes. When um, the vehicle got um, felt and then we started the journey, we went to we went um, straight to um, Kerewan, and then at Kerewan, as we are as we are entering the, um, Kerewan, uh, we met some policemen, you know, manning the checkpoint. It was only one policeman who was manning the checkpoint, but then the rest of uh, the policemen were just sitting down, playing draft. So we stopped, and then find out, you know, as to whether they have any idea about what is happening in Banjo, but the informers are no. Uh, they are not aware of anything taking place in Banjun. So from there, we proceeded to the area council. Then at the area council, we met uh, one man called Al Kali Jawara. I know him personally. So when we met Al Kali Jawara there, in fact, we asked him the same question as to what is happening. He said, well, he is not aware whether he is aware of um, anything going on in Banjun. 
He said no. He is not aware of uh, anything going on by you. So this is how we left the council. During your journey, did you receive any other information from anyone? Um, like what? Ma? You were traveling with a bunch of um, soldiers led by Jiba and um, Ture. Yes. Did you receive any information from them? Well, um, as we proceeded to the ferry crossing point, Luckily enough, um, we found the ferry on, um, on our side, that is the Kerawan side, and there was no waste of time. We just um, embarked, we, we boarded the, the, the ferry. And as we start sailing, it is um, during that process that um, young Kubature now disclosed to us that what actually is, was taking place in Banjun was um, a military coup. So when he, you know, disclosed this information, uh, some of us, we became surprised. I mean, it's like uh, we cannot just imagine it. Then, after when, he, when we dispersed, because in the ferry, we were together. He called us, and then we gathered, and then he disclosed that, well, what actually was happen, happening in Banyu was a military coup. So immediately when he dispersed, I had Lieutenant Jiba, Sam Jiba, saying in Olaf, hey, sude, sude, sude coup de tela man boku machi. Meaning that um, if it is a coup, he is not part of it. Did he say this in the presence of um, Yanko Baturi? Not at all. Not at all. Did you proceed with your journey at this point? Yes. Can you we, tell us what happened? After when we cross, then we moved straight to, to, to Bara. Then Bara, we went to um, Fort Bolen. But like actually, um, before Fort Bolen, there is a building. Before Fort Bolen. That's where we lodge. And then we use Fort Bolen as our observation post. That's where we... Um, mount our, you know, sentries. Why did you use Fort Bullen um, as an observation post? Um, looking at the, the structure, it has a, a higher level, uh, you know, platform, and then uh, you can easily, you know, observe um, at a very long distance and then notice of any, team, any movement going on around. So what did you do next? Um, at Fort Bullen, immediately when we arrived, LF Jame, I think with um, either two guys or so, went in town. What he went there for, actually, um, it was not known to us. And who, gave, who authorized him to go, we were not um, privy to know that. But later he came back. So when he came back, with a um, couple of minutes, uh, we saw one man, he, Elef Jamme, um, in fact, um, told us that yes, he went to this guy. Uh, that happens to be, I think he was the chief of um, Nyomi, uh, something money, uh, Tabora. Then he came. And then we greeted each other. Then we asked, in fact, it was um, Young Bature who asked him. Then he was explaining also that they had, that soldiers, you know, were moving from Yudum to State House to see the president. Even some of their guys from Nyobi who wanted to cross to Banjid were asked to go back. So there was no movement at all. Then he left, he went. He did not spend even um, 30 minutes with us. But at this point, you had already received information from Yanko Baturi about what was actually going on in Banjul, so you knew. Yes, yes. Um, also, when Yanko Baturi told you about the coup, did he tell you who else was involved, who, who was involved in the coup, or how it was planned? Did he give you any further information? He did not. He did not. He only Look, told us that, um, that, I mean, what actually was happening there, the soldiers moving up and down was a coup. 
looking at the actions of um, Yanko Boturi um, previously, as well as LF Jame, did you have any suspicions about their own involvement in the coup? At that time, no. At that time, no. But would you say that they were very eager to get to Banjul? Of course, that was well f from, from Farafenye. Because, um, like I said, for us, you know, when that announcement was made at um, Farafenye, we started wondering as to what might have happened that will lead the, the soldiers to move about. So, but with um, um, LF Jame and Yanko Baturi, the way they were moving, it's like they were in a hurry for us to leave Farafenya and then get to Para. What, for what reason? I don't know. So you got to Bara and um, you got to Fort Bulen, which was your observation point. Um, did anything else happen? Yes. You know, I told you that um, we left Farafenya with two officers. That is um, Sam Jiba being the senior man and then Yanko Bature. Um, but um, immediately when the information got to us, Sam Jiba is like, he has already declared himself that um, he's not part of it. So when we went, to, when we arrived in Fayambara, um, Yanko Bature crossed with um, some men. Actually, um, I'm not sure whether he, that was the very day that he crossed or the following day, but he crossed before us and then he went to Banyan. Um, can you tell us um, who the men were that he crossed with? One, he crossed with LF, with some, but actually it's, I, I cannot remember. After they crossed, what happened? Uh, after they crossed, um, we were there. Then um, thereafter, we also crossed by using one of um, the Navy boats. In fact, he, he um, Yanko Bature also crossed with the with, I mean, using the Navy boat. Um, when we crossed also, we went to the uh, Navy base and um, reported. Okay, you say that Yanko Bature crossed by boat and subsequently um, Sam Jiba and the group, which included you, also crossed by boat. Can you tell us um, who made those arrangements for the, for the boat to come and collect you? And where did the boat come from? It must have been Yanko Bature because he was very active in trying to, you know, communicate um, across. Yeah, please, can you tell us where this boat actually came from and the collected boat, you? Yeah, the boat came from the Gambia Navy. It came from the Gambia Navy. Did it come from Banjul? Right. So you crossed over, left Barra, crossed over to Banjul? Yes. Um, where did you go when you got to Banjul? We went to the Navy. And can you tell us what happened when you got there? Upon arrival at the Navy, of course, yes, we met the, some of the Navy personnel there. But um, the situation was a little bit chaotic because um, uh, nobody knows what was happening. I mean, nobody knows, you know, what was actually going on. I mean, then... Sam Jiba. Sorry um, to interrupt you. You say it was a bit chaotic. Um, can you just tell us what your observations were? Yes, because soldiers were moving about. I mean, you see vehicle, soldiers on board vehicle, on board vehicles moving. You know, coming to the Navy and then going out um, while some personnel of the Navy were on standby. So immediately when we arrived there, you know, Sam Jiba, in fact, contacted um, Major Sahar then, who, in fact, um, um, came back and then relayed the message to us that, um, yes, um, from the commander, that we are to remain at the Navy for a while. Can you tell us how long you spent um, at the Navy headquarters? I think we spent about two days. And during these two days, what did you do? No, we were just there on standby. Did Yanko Bature finally appear at some point? Yes. The very day that we arrived, Yankuba came later 
and then his mission was to come and then confirm if we have, we have actually crossed. So when, you know, he confirmed that he left, and from that very day, we could not, um, I for one, I did not, in fact, set my eye on him until when I heard that he was um, uh, Secretary of State. You initially um, informed us that it was um, Jiba who was actually the leader of the group. He yes. was senior to Ture at the time. Yes. Um, but it seems as you approached Barra and after the news came out about the coup from Yankubo Ture, he seemed to take a more prominent role. Is that correct? Yeah. Can you tell us what you believe was the reason why he he took that prominent role despite having a senior officer in the group. You see, like I said, um, when the news was broke, actually, um, Sam Jiba have already made up himself. That is, he has already zeroed it in his mind. That is to say, I, he is not part of it. So it is based on that. Uh, he tend to, you know, fan back. So Yankuba, knowing fully well what was happening and then somebody who has been in touch with whosoever his concern around there was so active in trying to make sure that at least, you know, what he yearned for has been achieved. So that is getting himself in banjo. So what you're trying to say is that um, Sam Jiba took a back seat and allowed Yankuba to lead the way because he was never in, 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 prepared to involve himself that's what i understand when young um Ture came to the um, navy headquarters did he give you any information about what was going on when he came in he went inside first before you know going inside he you know greeted us and then um, just to um, confirm that he said he's just uh, coming here to confirm that uh, we've already actually crossed. Then he went inside um, for a couple of minutes, then he went back. And at this point, you had not heard any information about um, Yanko Bature or anything that happened in relation to him? No. Immediately when he left, that was the end of the story. Okay. Can you tell us? after you left the Navy headquarters, where you went? When we left the Navy headquarters, um, together with Sam Jiba, we went to the State House. When you got to the State House, um, what happened? When we got to the State House, then um, the, state com the State Guard Commander was um, SP Mendy, late. Then he had a tete with um, Sam Jiba. So Sam Jiba came back and told us that, okay, we are to be part of the, the QRF, you know. So Can you tell us what the QRF was? Um, the QRF is like quick reaction force, like um, it's like a standby, a standby force. Men that are placed on standby for any quick reaction. So this is what, why it is called Q, quick reaction force. Can I just take you back a little bit? Um, if you can just go over and tell us um, how long you actually spent at the headquarters, the Navy headquarters. Like I said, um, um, I think we spent two days there. Two days. So you left the Navy headquarters, went to State House. Yes. You were attached to the QRF. Yes. Um, and where was um, Sam Jiba at this point? Sam Jiba immediately when we when we um, entered the state house he was with SP. But um, along the line, um, we were made to understand that he was asked to return back to Farafenye. Because since when we parted, you know he was with SP. You know then that was when I last saw him, I, me personally. Are you saying that you remained with the QRF? Yes, we were at the QRF, um, at the State House there, together with other soldiers. Did you see Yankuba Ture? Oh, no, 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 no. 
No. Did you receive any information from anyone whilst you were at the State House? About Yankuba Ture? About oh. anything that is of, is of significance. All right. Um, when we arrived at the State House, the first person that approached me was um, um, Kopul Kasama. We call him Imam. Um, because we, are, we, 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 I mean, we are close friends, sort of like army friends. He was the one who approached me and then um, tried to explain to me um, what happened because um, he knew that I was in Farafenje. You know, seeing me on the ground, he knew definitely I'm, you know, a new guy on the ground. So he was trying to explain to me what transpires, you know, from you know, day before yesterday to that day. And then he asked me if I can go and then meet the council members. I said, for what? He said, no, the council members are there. You can go and meet them, you know, because um, a lot of people have been going there to meet them, as you know. He said, no, if you go there and then meet them, if they know that you are here, you could be promoted. I said, no, no, no. That is what is it is. It is not part of my uh, plans. I don't think uh, I will, I'm interested in uh, meeting them. So he told me that he himself he was promoted from a corporal to a staff sergeant. I said, okay, it's well and good, fine. Then he went for them to ask if I have um, a reserve rank because then I was a staff sergeant. I told him yes, I have another rank, but it is in my bag. Maybe you can check me later. So okay. Then later on. He came, you know, for the rank. Then I took it out and gave it to him. Do you know whether he was given any ranks when he had actually been promoted by the council members? Do I know? Say it again, sir, please. Was he given any ranks? No. He was not wearing a rank. He only told me that he got promoted, I mean, uh, along with some other soldiers whom I, in fact, I saw carrying ranks, very strange, because like a lance couple carrying a sergeant rank. So it became so strange to me, and then I, I tend to believe on what he told me. And that is why he was actually asking for, yes. for your ranks, because yes. you were sergeant at the time. I was a staff sergeant. Can you tell us um, whether the reason why he asked you to go and see the council member members was to for you to have favors or to get some favors from them, which included obviously being promoted? You know, that is never my style. For me, I believe on, you know, sweating before getting it. So this is why when he approached me, I said, ah, which kind of this thing is this? I said, well, no, I'm not interested. So if they are out there promoting people, it's not a good find. But I, I don't think it is, it is necessary for me to go and admit them. Yes, the question um, was that whether that was the case, that if you had gone and actually met them, then you would have been promoted. I, I don't know. Can you tell us, um, you, mentioned, um, you, you mentioned the fact that you were actually given information. When you went to State House, you were given information about the events that happened from July, um, sorry, 22nd day of July, 94, the day of the coup, which was about two days, I believe, prior to the day that you came to State House. Can you give us more detail about exactly what um, you were, you were he told? He was explaining, yes. He's, um, it's like, um, he was trying to tell me um, where they started from Yundum coming down to the State House that um, there was no, you know, hustling on the way. They came, entered the Banjun, and then came to the State House um, freely like that. There was no obstacle here and there. And then they, they took over the State House with no fighting, no, I mean, very peaceful. So these were the words he was trying to, you know, put across. Um, you mentioned that you remained at State House at the QRF. Um, who did you remain there with? I was there with um, John Gomez, um, Ansumana Tamba, with a um, couple of um, 
you know, soldiers. Together with the soldiers that we met at the QRF. It's just like we, we've added their strength to, 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 to be part of the, 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 the QRF. What were your duties um, at the State House with the QRF whilst you were stationed there? We were never at, uh, assigned to any duty. We are just there. Um, what were your observations um, about your surroundings or the environment um, that you were in? Well, you know, to be, to, to be realistic and then to tell you the fact, you know, when we came to the State House as a trained soldier, for me, it's like um, the situation was, one, chaotic, two, there was a high level of uncertainty on the soldiers because um, it's like uh, they don't know what is going to, going to happen next. So to an extent, even like um, if you observe during daytime, you see a lot of soldiers in the city house, but during that night time, you don't see anybody apart from those, you know, soldiers who are detailed to take up the, you know, guard post. You don't see anybody. They will just disappear. So you can see the level of uncertainty because they are not sure what was going to happen next. You were also at State House, um, or rather, should I ask, how long were you actually at State House? I was at the State House, actually, um, I cannot vividly remember um, how many months or how many weeks, but I could remember um, uh, moving out of the State House during the month of either August or early September, redeployed out. So you were there for at least a month? Yes. Yes. Um, during the month that you were at State, State House, a lot of activities were happening. Detention Very of um, certain council members, yes. people being arrested and detained, ministers. Do you know anything about what happened in those situations? Actually, like I said, when we were there, it's like we were not assigned to any, 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 any decent, um, task. We were there just you know, as QR, personnel of the QRF. So what um, did you do next after you left the QRF after a month or so? Uh, one day we were called by SP, that is um, the State Guard Commander, um, Fernand SP Mendy, but um, we had already deployed that we should go to the headquarters. We should um, report at the headquarters. So we went to the headquarters. Um, the first person that we met was um, Sajime Oja, whom um, we reported to. And then he asked us to, you know, report to the army commander. Because when we went there, we explained, you know, the story to Just him. Just explain who you meant by, or who you mean by we. Myself, John Gomez, you know, we went to the headquarters and then we met um, Otuja. That when we explain our story to him, he refers us to the army commander. Then, that is um, um, Major Baji, sort of yes, Major Baji, so, um, Mauru Baji. Then we reported there, and he welcomed us. That is, initially he briefed us about um, the the current situation. Um, that is, um, yes, the. Junta have taken over, and there is actually a military to take over in the country. So the plan at the headquarters at this moment is how to get the soldiers back to the barracks, you know, and then make sure that there is total orderliness. And the command realized that um, myself, John Gomez, and then I, were both at the State House together with um, Ansumana Tamba. So based on that, he said, well, according to their plan, is that we cannot be at the same place, knowing our area of um, responsibility as drill instructors and so forth, that they, in they intend to redeploy us to battalions so that we can be appointed as RSMs. So on that note, 
Initially, John Gomez was um, transferred to Farafenye. Then Ansmana was made to stay. Then I was moved to Yundu. So this is how I was transferred to Yundu. You mentioned that uh, Lieutenant Colonel Momodo Baji was the commander of yeah. the army at the yeah. time. Yes. Was he the first army commander after the, uh, after the military yes. takeover? Yes, he was the first interim um, um, commander they appointed. You know, he was the first person they have appointed. So you were asked to return to the barracks and you were deployed um, to various places and you were deployed to Yundum in yes. particular. Yes. Um, what was your position or what was your um, assignment there at Yundum? Right. Like I said, based on the information from the, um, uh, the Army commander, that um, the plan is for us to be appointed as unit RSMs. So actually when I moved down to Yundum, um, then the commanding officer was uh, Basirubaro. And then the RSM was um, Sergeant Yankabare. So, so I went what was Basirubaro's um, rank at the time? Lieutenant. Lieutenant Basirubaro. Proceed, please. All right. So when I reported to Yundum, first, my point of call was in the RSM's office. So I met um, Sergeant Yankabari, who told me that, yes, they got the information that um, I'll be reporting there. Then he escorted me to the, to the CEO, that is Lieutenant Baro. And Lieutenant Baro, it happens that he, he was my um, bike mate. We trained together. But I knew him before we joined the Army. Then he was working at the Civil Aviation. Can you just tell me, you said um, Baro was your batch mate. Yes. Um, he was a lieutenant at the time, is that correct? Yes. And you were a sergeant? Staff sergeant. Staff sergeant. Can yes. you tell us um, why the difference in ranks? How come right. he was senior to you? You know, Basiru Baro, when he was um, at the civil aviation, I think he was an engineer, sort of. So it is based on that trait that he came into the army. And, um, and also it, it couple up with um, his um, qualification, education background. And it is based on, um, because he left a position at the civil division to come and join the army. And those days, um, um, the army needed engineers um, at that time. So although he rose through the ranks also, not that he came and then he was given a lieutenant. He was promoted as an NCO, and then he went up to the rank of um, Sergeant Major. Then from Sergeant Major, he was commissioned to become um, an officer. He, was he promoted after the coup? Basiru uh, Baro. Uh, Anyway, let's, I'll, I'll, find out. I'll find out. What about the other officers that you met um, in Yundum? Were they given accelerated promotions after the coup? No, sorry, sorry. Let me come back to Basirubaro. Basirubaro was never promoted after the coup. He was promoted before the coup. Sorry to, 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 to correct it. And then um, when I reported at Yundum and met um, Nyankabare, Nyankabare then escorted me to, to meet the CEO, uh, that is um, Lieutenant Baro. So when I went there, in fact, um, he welcomed me and then expressed a gratitude that um, I'm coming to join them, because knowing that um, we are bad mates, in fact, I call him class. So he briefed me about um, the activities in the unit and expressed you know, interest in my contribution towards the um, development of the camp. And thereafter, um, he now called Jibril Sey. Jibril Sey, Lieutenant Sey, was then the OC admin company stroke battalion recruiters. Then Sey came in and he also introduced, him, introduced me to him, say we know each other be well before, and then 
ask Say to, you know, take me to his office so that we can start from there. Um, did Kabara explain any issues they had at Yundum or any problems they were encountering with the soldiers at the time which they needed your assistance with? Actually, young Kabare, during his briefing, the issues that he raised were um, the problems they had in harmonizing the former TSG personnel with um, the GNA personnel. And secondly, to um, the tax of the unit in terms of security, because they were covering a very wide um, range. Um, they used to deploy troops up to Bonto transmitter, and then also with um, other areas like the airport, you know, uh, Abuko Art Station, you know, and then also with the council members, that is the, the discussion, and then also the patrols that they normally conduct on daily and night basis. You know, thereafter, um, they brief me about um, the welfare of the troops on the ground, actually. He told me about um, can we concentrate on the harmonization um, of the soldiers? You mentioned that they were from different backgrounds. Can you explain these different backgrounds and what issues rose up as a result of that? All right. Um, what I mean by that is, you know, the Zanadmeri, the TSG personnel, were trained as, you know, police. Then, for the soldiers, they are trained combat, uh, in combat, combatant um, um, training. They, they receive combatant training. So, the TSG, they are, you know, more into law and minor police duties than the military. So, having this, you know, different background of training, bringing them together, it requires a lot of effort. So that's what it means. Was there any issues with um, lack of discipline, lack of orderliness, or lack of regimentation within um, the barracks, within Yundum barracks, due to the fact that um, the gendarmerie soldiers who were incorporated there came from a different discipline? One, regimentation, that was a problem. Discipline, well, my short term with um, Nyanka Bare before I took over f um, fully, I did not had him mention anything with regards to lack of discipline. But um, with the issue of regimentation, yes, he made mention of that. And then also uh, getting them together was like a challenge, simply because you know, the challenge is that he was a sergeant. And here we have a situation where you have warrant officers, class one, class two, from the defunct um, TSG coming to join. And then a sergeant is there acting as RSF. So that was a little bit, uh, you know, a little bit degree of, um, you know, challenge that he was encountering there. You mentioned that um, Kabara was the acting RSM when you came to Yundum, and y were you to take over from him? Yes. Immediately when I received um, the briefing from um, Lieutenant Jibril Say, um, we went to, I went with him, Nyan Kabare, to his office, where he, in fact he briefed me, like I said earlier on. Um, after the briefing, actually, I allow him to, to continue the admin bit of it whilst I observe what was um, happening. Then immediately when I took over from him, after some couple of days, I started it. But um, Lieutenant Mubaro, in fact, was quick to prompt you know, me that um, I cannot be 
you know, carrying a staff sergeant rank and then appointed, you know, an RSM. So that was the time he instructed um, uh, like uh, Lieutenant Say to give me a warrant officer rank and then be acting, you know, RSM. But if in that warrant officer class two rank was an acting, you know, rank. So this is how he, in fact, um, um, he, he elevated me to act in that capacity. Can you tell us um, what the roles and responsibilities of an RSM are in the, in the Army? Just briefly. Yes. Don't go into much detail. All right. RSM is like um, um, if we uh, move out of the military institution and going back to our local area, it's like if you talk about a village and then you say the Alcalo one. Now coming back to the military, the RSM is the, um, uh, the, the person responsible for discipline and orderliness in a military barracks. He enforces discipline. Two, RSM is the main link man from the command and the troops. Because you cannot move to the command without passing through the RSM. Three, RSM ensures that the daily routine of a unit are observed in an orderly manner. RSMs also make so that the welfare of the troops are looked into. RSM also observes whatever goes, goes wrong, goes in the, in the camp and advise the commanding officer for decision making. So it's like then the last one on the list, RSM, you know, serves as the ears and the eyes of the commander besides the duty officer in a military barracks because the duty officer, once his commander is away or like he closes from work, he takes place of the duty, he represents the duty officer. looks like your role as RSM was very important um, as a liaison between the soldiers and the command. Is that yes. correct? Yes, ma'am. After you handed over to Kabare, can you tell us where Kabare, I, Kabare went? I took over from Kabare. Sorry. Took over and yes, when Kabare I took handed <coughs> over to you. Where did he go after that? Yes, when I took over, <coughs> sorry, when I took over from young Kabare, he was redeployed to the, to the companies as a platoon sergeant. He was still within Yundum. He did not, he was he, not redeployed yes, to another camp. Yes, he was within Yundum. Can we move on to November 11th, the events surrounding November 11th? Um, just tell us what you were doing before the November 11th date. Were you preparing for anything in particular? Yes, um, November 11, you know, coincides with uh, the unit's preparation to perform the usual annual remembrance parade. Can you tell us um, what the remembrance parade was? All right, um, remembrance parade, it's a solemn parade that, was, that is always mounted or performed to you know, remember the fallen soldiers, be it during wartime or normal date. And it is normally performed in the second Sunday of November. So, so this particular one was scheduled to take place on the 13th of November 1994. Kindly tell us um, what preparations you were making um, in relation to that event? Like I said, we were preparing for um, the parade. In a sense, we started rehearsal. Normally, a parade is mounted. And before we mount the parade, 
we do embark on rehearsal. And at that particular time, I was the one responsible for uh, the rehearsal. I'll first of all, ensure that uh, the men are provided, they are available for the, for, the, for the parade, and then also the officers are available. So in a nutshell, like the composition of the parade, I have to make sure that it is completed. Can you tell us who was supposed to be part of the parade? Um, actually, the composition of the parade is like um, six officers and the 96 other ranks. And these 96 other ranks, in fact, includes even, you know, senior NCOs, senior non-commissioned officers. During this time, you were also responsible for, for the drill yes. um, aspect. You yes. were actually instructing the men in drill. Were you actually assisted by anybody? Very well. That time, um, Alaji Kanye was um, one of my drill instructors that I normally rely on because um, um, I use him to at least, you know, <coughs> orientate the personnel from other services, that is, the personnel from the TSU, TSU, sorry. And he was. I, I, I assign him to, to, to take them on extra, you know, um, hours on drill so that at least they become acquainted with um, our standard. You're saying that um, the soldiers that had a gendarmerie background were not very good with, with drill and parade? Not all of them, some. Okay. So. And um, as a result, you assigned Alaji Kanye to take yes. them on extra classes to yes. improve? Yes. During the times when you were doing the rehearsals for the Remembrance Day Parade, can you tell us if you noticed anything strange about the behavior of the men? Actually, to be frank with you, I had, I had a very tough time um, during that time because um, um, first, um, not with the men. The men were always available and then ready for the rehearsal. But uh, my problem lies with the officers, because actually the officers, um, their attitude towards uh, that particular, you know, parade rehearsals were definitely not satisfactory and then on becoming of um, officers. Thank you, Mr. Witness. I think we'll um, stop there for today so that we can give a chance to the commissioners to ask any questions um, if necessary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. May I hand over the witness to you? Thank you very much, Chairman Council, and thank you very much, Chairman Officer Sanya. Uh, do we have any questions from commissioners? If not, we will wait um, uh, till tomorrow. We continue and uh, then uh, pose some questions. Uh, if there are no other points, um, uh, we would end the meeting and uh, see you tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you all very much. Quick one.